Rockinitis. Anyway, this should be like this first episode should be kind of clocking in at about half hour, you know. But if it runs over, I'll just put it in part two or something, you know. Yeah. Later, I'll just figure it out later. <laughs> it's a sign, Michael. <laughs> I'm waiting for that light. I don't see it. Oh. Oh, is it rolling? Yeah. Okay. Are ready? Okay. Hi, cats and kittens. Welcome to Rockinitis. My name is Michael Wilmore. And my special guest here is Rob Frith, who has a great record store between 19th and 20th in Vancouver. Thank you. Yeah. Called Neptune Records. Yes. So we're going to do a show on Paul Revere and the Raiders. And that's one of my all-time favorite groups. I feel like they were kind of, um, kind of given short shrift by a lot of people because of the uniforms they wear. And even still, I think. Yeah, I think like, people look at pictures of them and they think, how can that be any good? It looks really glitzy. I think, yeah, I mean, and you look at like the um, uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yeah. And you see like the people that have been inducted into that and they haven't, they haven't brought in Paul Revere the Raiders. No, that's right. They have actually. It's I got a phone call uh, last uh, Friday morning when I was doing my radio show, mm -hmm. and a guy phoned in and said, "You know, how come they haven't been inducted in? What is it? Politics or what? What's keeping them out?" Well, I, mean, I, I couldn't answer. Donna that. Summers in there. <laughs> the Beastie Boys are in there. Yeah, like being the all Sex kind of, Pistols are in there. All kinds I of mean, people. Not less. to diss those bands, but still, I mean, Paul Revere and the Raider had a lot more hit songs. Yes, and were they were more influential iconic. in a lot of ways Absolutely. than some of those groups. Yeah. And they have a long, convoluted history. Yeah, and they were right there at the birth of it, too. Like, you know, yeah. in the 50s, you know, out there playing these, you know, small clubs and then working their way up. It wasn't like they were just some manufactured band. Mm -hmm. They actually had their kind of history. They ended up put into the position of like the, the now manufactured bands at the more towards the end of their career when they'd already been popular. That's true. You know, with the, where the action is shown. But the, so. there was a, a thing like in the 60s, if you were there and you saw it all unfolding as, you know, the months and years went by and stuff, the, band, the idea of a band wearing a uniform on stage was extremely uncool all of a sudden in the late mm. 60s. Yeah, that's right. Because everybody was, you know, themselves, and, and basically band uniforms were totally out. But they were, they were kind of like the impetus behind other bands, hundreds of bands, having band uniforms. I mean, they had the coolest band uniforms oh, yeah. of the, anyone. And the thing is, they were like such an active band on stage. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, just like moving around like crazy. Mm -hmm. And do you imagine wearing one of those things? <laughs> How hot it must have been? Yeah, yeah. Oh my God, just like, you know, those are pretty heavy duty suits. I wanted to mention, um, one of the things that you do, I think, culturally to Vancouver, that's very important, culturally, is you have record store day at the store. That, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And uh, other record stores in town have record store day as well. But yours is really cool. Yeah, it's it's uh, actually I got a poster for the for the last one we did. Okay, it's kind of cool. It's a great lineup. Um, 
and uh, you've actually discovered some of your sort of favorite bands. Well, that's, uh, I think it's, it, like, it's a good way to peruse, you, you know, if you're window shopping, yeah. to peruse bands that are happening around town. Because sooner or later, virtually every band in town plays in your store at some point. Yeah, it seems Usually. like that way, yeah. yeah. So you get to kind of, uh, like the last time we went, went there, I didn't like it. one single band you had the whole day. <laughs> but often I, I make a discovery. Yeah, well, I know, I know you've liked a lot of the bands that have played there, but the, um, the, the thing is, like, you know, we don't put bands, like every band there isn't our favorite band. Mm -hmm. But we think that every band that plays at the store is, is good at what they do, mm -hmm. and, and, and they have an audience. So we're not just catering to ourselves, you know, when we have bands play. I, I realize that. And what, what I think is funny is every band has their little entourage. That's right. I yeah. mean, you, you, you see this group coming in from, you know, outer Surrey or some, uh, somewhere out in the hinterlands. Yeah. And you see all these kids that kind of look like people in the band. Yeah. That's that true. suddenly that's arrive. That's true. Yeah. They suddenly arrive like five minutes before the band goes on. Yeah. And then you kind of are trying to assess what kind of band this could be before you even hear them based on what their audience looks like. Yeah, that's <laughs> very true. Well, we got the, the Car Free Day thing on Main Street, too. Oh, that's good, it's too. It's coming up in June, and uh, that's always good. We always have a bunch of bands playing there. Mm -hmm. And there's other stages along, all on Main Street, like other, other businesses have bands mm -hmm. playing, too, so that's a really cool event. Yeah. Anyway, Paul Revere and the Raiders. I've got some notes here. Um, Paul Revere, his real name is Paul Revere Dick. That's right, yeah. D-I-C-K. And uh, he was kicked out of high school for throwing a typewriter out the window, I guess, <laughs> I during typing class. Yeah, I guess uh, one of the early ADD. Yeah. Uh, now, if you, if, you know, if you know guys in high school, like I knew guys in high school, they, they were kind of entrepreneurs. Like I went to school on the west side. Yeah. So you get a lot of like rich kids and they learn from their fathers, you know, how to move bucks and things like that. So we always had a couple of guys at school in high school presenting dances, and the guy would be selling tickets, and he'd have a big roll of tickets, and he'd be dispensing the tickets in the hallway between classes oh, yeah. and selling them and stuff. And like that's a future entrepreneur, right? Well, I was in Burnaby, and my, my, I was an entrepreneur, but except I hitchhiked to Surrey and bought firecrackers because they were illegal in Burnaby and sold them in Burnaby. <laughs> <laughs> See, well, you were a merchant <laughs> even then. I was a then. merchant even then, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so Paul Revere was that type of kid. And he, yeah. Anyway, he got kicked out of school, and then he enrolled in barber school because you didn't need a high school diploma to get in. Right, yeah. yeah. So then he borrowed $500 and opened his own barber shop. And he was only 19. And then he owned three barber shops. Then he sold them and bought a drive-in restaurant when he was 21. Yeah, this is all before he was 21 years yeah, old. Yeah. It's amazing. So, I mean, he, here's a great picture of him on the back of the first album. And Paul Revere was the kind of kid that was basically an entrepreneur in school. And there he is there. Anyway, uh, he supplemented his income by playing piano at the Elts Club with a group called the Downbeats, named after Downbeat magazine, you know, the jazz yeah, magazine? Yeah, the jazz magazine. And uh, one time uh, he was playing piano at the Elts Club with his group, and Mark Lindsay, who was 18, and worked after school in a bakery, he dropped in uh, to sit in with the band and sang a song. Well, I heard that they'd met uh, while he was delivering bread to his drive-in. Well, yeah, well, what happened was Mark Lindsay came in and dropped into the Elks Club and sang a whole lot of shaking going on with Paul Revere. And he was like only 18 at the time. So Paul Revere drives, uh, goes over to the drive-in, or goes over to the bakery to pick up some buns for his restaurant, right. for his drive-in restaurant. And the kid in the, sitting there behind the counter with a big chef's hat on, is, and he's all covered with dough and, <laughs> and that kind of stuff, he, uh, he's telling him, oh, uh, well, I had this really great gig last night at the Elks Club, and uh, this 18-year-old this kid came up and sang with a band. He was pretty good. And he, and he pulls off this chef's hat and goes, yeah, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. So that's how they kind of started out. It's amazing how random things can be yes. like that. Yeah. Anyway, their very first record was called uh, Beatnik Sticks, which was a takeoff on Chopsticks and sold a lot in the Northwest. It was a big hit. Actually, it was also a big hit in Vancouver. 
It made number nine in Vancouver, and it uh, was sure. on the charts for nine weeks on CKWX. And this came out on the Gardena label, not the Gardenia label, the Gardena label in 1960. So maybe you could stick yeah, it up there. Yeah, stick oh, it right there, there, yeah. Okay, hand it over to me and we'll play it. This is the very first record by Paul Revere and the Raiders called Beatnik Sticks. Oh, I've got to put the 45, 45 center up. Yeah, it works. It works. <laughs> Both sides of the very first record by Paul Revere and the Raiders, Beatnik Sticks and Orbit the Spy in brackets after that. And I always thought, like when I had this record as a kid, uh, it had a skip at the beginning of it on Orbit the Spy, oh, really? but not on the other side. Anyway, I, it, it started off with that outer space sound and then it kind of made a, a groove jump. And I always thought that's the way it sounded. <laughs> really? And then when I finally got like a clean version of it. Uh, you thought there was something wrong with I it? I thought it was something wrong with it because <laughs> it didn't have this kind of jump in it that I was used to hearing. It's funny how that happened. Anyway, I'll hand it back to you there. Yeah, I remember I took a record to a party once and someone stuck a cigarette out on the record and I could, oh, I, there was one song on the album I could never play after that. Why would they do that? Did they, I have no They didn't idea. like that cut? Or? I guess wow. they were just dumb. So Paul Revere and Mark Lindsay became friends, and Mark would drop by to sing a couple of songs with the downbeats. This is all happening in Boise, Idaho, where the group was based. And uh, Paul told Mark that he could become a permanent member of the group. He could actually join the group if he learned to play an instrument. So Mark Lindsay took up the saxophone. And they changed their name to Paul Revere and the Raiders when they got a contract with Gardena Records. And the guy was talking to Paul Revere, the guy at Gardena Records, was talking to Paul Revere in the office and said, what's your name? And he said, Paul Dick. <laughs> so he said, ah, I don't like the sound of that. What's your, what's your middle name? He says, Revere. He goes, Paul Revere? He says, oh, you got to use that. <laughs> He said, that, that's a, you know, that, that has a, you know, a press agent's ring to it. Oh, that's yeah, a perfect totally. name. What's your group called? The Downbeats. Oh, I don't like that. Paul Revere and the Downbeats? How about Paul Revere and the Night Riders? I don't like that too much, he says. How about Paul Revere and the Night Raiders? Uh, too many words. How about Paul Revere and the Raiders? That's it! <laughs> oh, yeah. So anyway, they stuck with that name from then on. Yeah, I mean, it just couldn't have been better. Yeah. Anyway, so that is actually his real name, but it's actually his first name and his middle name. Yeah. And he dropped the 
the last name. Oh, by the way, I, I've got a single here, which uh, is by a group. When they played at this club in Portland later, uh, they had a, a group that they uh, played with that uh, whenever Paul Revere went out on the road with the group for, on tour, yeah. uh, this other group filled in for them. And they were called Gentleman Jim and the Horseman. Oh, yeah. And the club that they played at in Portland was called the Headless Horseman. So Paul Revere's name is actually on this single under the composer credits, directly under the song title. And the Gentleman Jim and the Horseman only ever had this one single. That's all they ever released. Who was it? Uh, um, Mike Smith that owned a club in Portland. Was that the same club? Smitty Smith or? Another guy. Yeah, the, the drummer. Okay, yeah. yeah. He owned a club in Portland. Might have been. I'm just wondering if it was the same club. I don't, I don't know. It was called the Headless Horseman, and it was in Portland. But at this time, they were located in Boise, Idaho still. Right. And they were the only group in, in <laughs> Boise, Idaho, oddly enough. And, then, <laughs> and they became... Part, part of the thing with the Northwest Sound is it, it was like Washington, Idaho, and Oregon. And that's the Pacific Northwest. And I mean, Vancouver. And, well, and Vancouver to some degree, yeah. yeah. So uh, anyway, that was comprised of Northwest Sound, and Paul Revere and the Raiders were right in on the ground floor of the Northwest Sound from the very beginning. Primarily in the middle, in the beginning, it was an instrumental sound. Yeah, like almost everything. They, yeah. uh, there was the odd vocal, but mostly yeah. instrumentals. and they did instrumentals. And their follow-up to it was uh, a thing called Like Long Hair, and this is actually a, a takeoff on... Uh, a classical piece, and it's um, it's actually Rachmaninoff's Prelude in C sharp minor. Of course, done rock and roll style. <laughs> anyway, they it was uh, such a popular hit that they actually put out an album uh, called Like Long Hair. This is the first album by Paul Revere and the Raiders, and I bought it off um, Rick. Uh, Rich um, Hagenson. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know him? Yeah, I know Rich, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, and he, he collects and, instrumentals. Yeah, and he collects instrumentals. And he told me this is the greatest instrumental album ever. Well, it's so weird, too, because, you know, they, uh, they went down to try and get a record deal and they were shopping around and they couldn't get anywhere. Then all of a sudden they got offered like five record deals at the same time. <laughs> so, like, uh, you know, they were for some small band just sort of showing up to. To LA, it was a big deal. Yeah, yeah this amazing. wasn't actually quite as big a hit, oddly enough, but it was a hit, and uh, this actually made number thirty-eight on Billboard, and made number twenty-nine in Vancouver. So not quite as big as their first hit. Yeah, but big nonetheless. And uh, we'll play it here off the LP. Like Long Hair by Paul Revere and the Raiders, which is Rashmaninoff's Prelude in C Sharp Minor.
That's actually the very first time that uh, Mark Lindsay ever sang on a record, the tune Sharon, the tune that uh, Paul Revere had originally given to uh, Jim Dunlop, who was the lead singer in uh, Gentleman Jim and the Horseman. They had recorded it first, but it didn't make it on the only record by Gentleman Jim and the Horseman. So he recorded it himself with uh, Mark Lindsay on vocal. It's interesting how fast uh, Mark Lindsay got to be pretty good at saxophone. Yes. It's amazing, really. You think he hadn't really been playing it that long. It's not like he was like, not like it had been around the house or something like that. And well, he learned, uh, that, like he, Paul Revere told him he could join the group if he learned an instrument. Yeah. So he got an album by uh, L. Houston, you know, one of those guys, yeah. those uh, sax players like Big J. McNeely and those guys. Mm -hmm. And uh, this guy used to lie on his back on the stage and, and go honk, squee, honk, squee on the saxophone. Anyway, that's where he, where he learned to play sax up from. I guess back then, too, a lot of kids in school, you'd, you'd take band and yeah. they always had the marching bands and stuff like that. So yeah. maybe there was some little bit of experience there. I yeah. Not quite as big a hit. Made number 38 on Billboard charts, number 29 in Vancouver. And uh, in Vancouver, or in Canada, it was released on the Quality label, but in the U.S. it was released on the Gardena label. And Paul Revere, uh, at this point, a big dilemma happened. Uh, he, he got drafted. Yeah. But because his background was um, Quaker, right. uh, he uh, basically got out of it. He got out of the draft. And... Um, <clears throat> In 62, Paul Revere got drafted and the group broke up. And Paul got deferred because of his Mormon religion. And he got a job at the state hospital in Portland, Oregon, working as a, uh, in the state mental hospital, working as a, a cook. So Mark Lindsay and the rest of the group, the rest of the group went elsewhere, but Mark Lindsay kind of hung around with nothing to do for a few months. Great experience uh, dealing with musicians. Yes. Working in the mental hospital. Yes. <laughs> anyway, so Mark Lindsay decided to relocate to Portland. So in Paul's off hours, when he wasn't working at the mental hospital, they started playing at the local legions and things like that with pickup musicians and stuff. And that was the beginning, the true beginning of Paul Revere and the Rage, because it was the second incarnation of them or whatever. Yeah, the classic lineup. Yeah. Anyway, one day they were walking down the street in Portland, Oregon, and they passed a costume shop. And at this time, they all wore band uniforms that were just kind of like regular band yeah. uniforms at the time. Yeah, I've actually got some good shots of that. And the downbeats, and later Paul Revere and the Raiders, there's some shots here of the way they looked in the early days. And they were walking down the street and saw this costume shop, and there was some Revolutionary War costumes on, on mannequins in the window. Yeah. And uh, anyway, they went, hey, look at those costumes there. You know, th that's how the old guys used to dress, you know, back during the Revolutionary War. They wore like three-point hats and frock coats and buckle shoes. That's actually kind of a cool look. <laughs> and they said, hey, what if, what if we uh, dress up like that at our dance tonight at the armory? You know, let's, let's maybe rent those costumes and give them to the rest of the guys, and we'll all go on stage wearing those. So they went on stage wearing these Revolutionary War costumes, and everything changed. The audience reaction was totally different. The band played different, played better. Yeah, and, and, it, and it was like it, it, anyway. Paul Revere afterwards said, "I think we got something here." Well, apparently they they showed up like they rented it for one night. And they show up the next night without those those suits, and everybody's saying, "Hey, where's the suits?" And they're all like freaking out, like those are so cool. And they think. Oh man, you know, and so then they that that helped to sort of reinforce the Yeah, I mean the they idea. they real they kind of found their niche. Yeah. All of a sudden, just just on a fluke. Yeah, it's just amazing. Yeah. Anyway, so then they went on stage from then on, then finally got they got uh revolutionary war costumes made especially for each guy in the group and then that was the the look they had from then on. He was 
was a going pipe cat for this old Revere. Rockin' Paul Revere, yeah. you know he said to stand Go on the shore and watch for my lights. I'm gonna blink him Go once, oh, oh, blink him twice. Once if I land, then twice if I see, then off of my trial. They ain't gonna catch me. Uh, he was a cautious mother, this old Revere. Rockin' Paul Revere. Tell you not a wife is wife. She can't cook. She don't know no recipes that out of the book. She can't make a sandwich without she sauce and butter. Don't even know how to boil hot water. Let me tell you what we had last night. On she can't cook. Have beans, beans, beans coarse, gentle, and tomato, cold, cause of rubber and a cherry and you. I almost choked before I got through, and she said, Eat it up, eat it all up. What you say? Basically, at this point, they were based in Portland, and they met a, a disc jockey called Roger Hart, and he became their manager, and they became the house band at the Headless Horseman Club. Well, back, back then, the most disc jockeys used to put on shows as well yes. at all different places. Well, that's actually how the Northwest Sound came to be, because it was a commercial tie-in. Yeah. Because all these disc jockeys would be emceeing at dances, and the band that they had playing at the dances, they would play the record to promote the dance. And a lot of the DJs were pretty famous themselves. Like yes. They were real personalities back then. So yeah. you know, they were the good guys. Yeah, they were they were famous in their you know, in their uh, wherever the airwaves uh, waves would uh, send them, they would be pretty popular in those yeah. areas. And anyway, they would. It was actually kind of rampant commercialism. Really, really think about it, because they the only reason these bands got airplay. Oh yeah. On local radio in the Northwest was because the disc jockeys wanted people to attend their dances. Yeah. So and they'd go, well, tonight at so and so Armory, or or Teen Club or whatever, and they'd play the band. This is the yeah. band that's going to be playing, and they're great, don't you think? Or oh, something yeah. like that. And then it would chart, and all that. So the Northwest Sound had support in a commercial sense from the disc jockeys on commercial radio. Yeah. Yeah. Rockin' Rockin Night is. Too 